We begin today with a special hearing held by the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, or the PCLOB. The public hearing took place today in Washington, D.C., and was meant to take into consideration the recommended changes to both the Patriot Act and to FISA, also known as the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. At the hearing, one proponent of the current legislation, a former Justice Department intelligence official, commended the FISA court, calling it a national treasure. Take a listen. In many ways, I would say, notwithstanding much of what has been written in the press, the FISA court is a national treasure. It has done its job uh, in an exemplary fashion during wartime. But along with the support came some vocal resistance to current NSA policies, specifically from those who are representing large tech companies. My client work has given me a unique view into the position of providers, internet service providers, who receive demands under FISA and has helped me see two aspects of the process which I believe are inconsistent with the core principles of our legal system. First, the overbroad cloak of secrecy that applies to everything FISA related and the lack of a true adversarial process. Now, keep in mind that this is an oversight board that was established back in 2007 to ensure that the privacy and civil liberties of Americans were appropriately considered in the implementation of all laws and policies related to terrorism. But even though it was established back in 2007, it wasn't until 2012 that individuals were actually nominated to sit on the board, meaning this is a fairly new oversight committee. So here to talk about the role this board is likely to play going forward, I'm joined by Himanshu Nigam, the founder of leading privacy advisory firm SSP Blue. Himanshu, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me, Amir. Well, we know that this hearing took a look at both the Patriot Act and FISA, but what parts of the legislation were really up for review? Well, I have to tell you, it, it even though they're supposed to target certain pieces of legislation and look at everything, they are actually doing that. They are looking from what it appears at everything. I don't think there's anything on the table that's not up for grabs and up for review. But that said, there were a couple things that came out. One is whether or not the phone record capability, tapping of phone records and collection of phone records should be completely done away with. That was one extreme or should there be changes on it. Another was whether there should be a special advocate assigned specifically to sit inside the FISA courts, the secret courts, to raise the civil liberty questions and the privacy questions. And those are two extremely significant things that are being discussed right now. Yeah, and the hearing is actually not done. It should be done in just a little bit, so hopefully we'll be hearing some results out of that. Uh, but this board was actually set up in 2007. It took five years, however, to get people actually seated on the board. What's your sense as to why it took so long? Well, I think there's a couple of things. One is that, number one, at the, it was passed and signed into law in 2007, and then there was a change in presidency, and I think that has a big impact on how things move or how quickly they move. And second, and probably more important than anything else, including what will happen with this board going forward, is the fact that right now in Congress, nothing is really happening when it comes to legislation and action moving forward because of the battles that go on between the, as they say inside the beltway, between the D's and the R's, but really for your viewers, the Democrats and the Republicans. Sure. And I think that's going to delay every step forward. And they'll, for, with every step forward, there'll be a few steps back in that tr struggle that pulling will go back and forth. And who are the people sitting on this board? Do they fall along Democratic uh, and Republican party lines? Well, I think anything, as I was saying, inside the Beltway, anything inside the Beltway, there is no such thing as not being along political or party lines. But if you do look at the resumes, which I did look at, it is truly the who's who of America when it comes to privacy and justice. So there is, there seems to be, at least on the surface of it, a balance between the two sides. But I will tell you, there is an extreme leftist bent um, that, that comes out strikingly. And also the people who submitted information and requests for what area should be reviewed come very strongly from the civil libertarian side of view or the privacy and pro-privacy side of view, as opposed to the pro-law enforcement action and uh, counterintelligence action side of view. Interesting. And, and this is considered to be an independent agency. But what kind of authority does it actually have? Can it do more than just, for example, offer criticism of the NSA? I think the easiest way to put it is it has the authority to ask. 
And that's where, in many ways, and then based on the questions that come out, to make recommendations. It has no enforcement power. Currently, it has no subpoena power. But it does have the ability to ask questions. And in many ways, it's almost like a government-sanctioned organization that is its own whistleblower if it does find something when it's asking the questions. And Hemu, this board, like you mentioned, does not have subpoena authority. That means it cannot force an agency to produce documents or answer questions on its own. Instead, it would have to ask the attorney general to issue a subpoena on its behalf. Isn't that a challenge to uh, its ability to really act as an independent body? Well, sometimes you can conduct a lot of business and ask a lot of questions without ever asking for a subpoena to be issued. Does it have pure independence? I don't know if it really needs to. And the answer is yes, it doesn't have pure independence, but does it really need to if it can ask all the questions? And if it's not getting the right answers or the answers it thinks are open and honest and truthful and disclosing enough information, it can raise those questions further and then raise them not only privately, but more important than anything else in the times that we're in right now is to raise it publicly without worrying about the fact that it leaks something or it's going to get punished or it has to go hide out in Russia like somebody else is doing. Sure. And as I understand it, Senator Pat Leahy wants to give the board subpoena power to investigate issues about privacy and national security. This uh, would be through the legislation he's sponsoring with Rep. Uh, Jim Sensenbrenner. What's the likelihood we'll see this happening considering the uh, increasing scrutiny of NSA policies? Well, I think no, there's no question that legislation is going to get attention. But if you look at it, one of the big things about it is I think there's 16 uh, senators who have co-signed it, all of them are Democrats. And there's 60 in the House. And I think what you're going to see is not bipartisan legislation moving forward. You're going to see a very um, non-bipartisan or just pro-Democrat. And again, it's going to run into the, all those roadblocks that we've seen with every else, everything else that's going on the, on the Hill right now, which is the Dems fighting the R's. And, and, and it's going to continue. And I, I think ultimately, it will raise awareness, but then end up dying out. Sure. Well, I appreciate you coming and breaking that down for us. Himanshu Nigam, founder of SSP Blue. Thanks. Thanks, Samira.